Hey everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Eagle Eye. Uh, I'm Dave Zangaro. We have Ruben Frank and Barrett Brooks joining us hey. today. Uh, Barrett's going to be joining us throughout the summer. Um, and, you know, typically we, we try to give everyone an escape. We try to talk about football. And we've done that throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we're not going to do that today. Uh, we're not going to talk football. It, it, it's just honestly not the, the right move. Um, so I apologize for those of you who tuned in today thinking you're going to hear us talk about training camp and, and, and position battles because that's not what we're going to do today. Um, I encourage you to stay with us, though, because I, I think we're going to have a, an important and open discussion about race, about an athlete's role in social change, and about our roles as, as citizens, black, white, every color in social change. Um, it's it's important to have these discussions, so I'm, I'm happy to have both of you gentlemen to talk about it. Um, I do want to start today, uh, Jeffrey Lurie, just before we started recording this, released a statement. Um, I, I thought it was notable that he had been silent until this point, but a, a pretty lengthy statement. Um, he talked about his repulsion at um, racial injustice in the country. And he vowed to do more. He vowed to use his platform uh, for better. Um, let's start there, gentlemen. Uh, Jeffrey Lurie's statement, what did you take from it? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I think uh, Philadelphia is really lucky to have uh, a leader like Jeff, Jeff Lurie um, who has that platform and has, you know, puts his money where his mouth is and always has with donations, charitable endeavors. Um, you know, I mean, the, Eagles uh, Youth Partnership, which is now Eagles Charities, and um, the iMobile. Um, the Eagles have been as active in, in contributing to the community as, as any team that I, I've ever seen. And I think um, Jeff is a, a very thoughtful guy who, you know, um, has devoted a good chunk of his life to affecting change in the community, and that's important. And I think his words are, uh, you know, I was surprised, like you said, he hadn't said anything until now. He hadn't put out a statement, but uh, I think it was an important one. And I think when it comes from him, it's not just words. I think he wants he wants to use the platform that he's been giving as uh, he's been given as owner of this team to uh, to make a difference in the community. And this is something that means a lot to him. And you know, I think you start there with Jeff Lurie that it's not just um, it's not just words. I think I think he believes it, and I think he means it, and uh, I think he really does want to be uh, a positive force in in bringing about change in the community. Yeah, you know, just you know, with understanding uh, that, you know, I I, I worked under under uh, Mr. Lurie, you know, real good guy. In fact, Miguel Rube knows Rube. Who was the first offensive lineman he ever drafted? Me. Uh, that would <laughs> probably be Rob Selby. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, seriously, you know, in working with him and understanding, you know, Mr. Lurie, he, he's one of those guys, he's very genuine um, in his, you know, approach to the team. He doesn't change for anybody. He understands that um, he has to be uh, a stable force in the organization. That's what he's done. You know, he's he's worked towards being the type of owner that he is, a well-respected owner now. I can remember when we first got him, uh, him and Ray Rose didn't get along well, uh, you know, simply because, you know, he thought, you know, Ray Rose thought that he was just buying the team because it was just one of his toys or whatever. But no, you know, he generally took an interest not just in his team, but in his players. He took an interest in me. Um, I, I still believe to this day I can call Mr. Lurie right now and, 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 you know, have a conversation with him, you know, and he would pick up the phone and answer it for me. But, uh, you know, just today, you know, in our in quick slant, so Mary and Derek Gunn had an opportunity to talk to Brandon Graham, and he talked – we asked him, you know, what was going on? You know, what was the meeting about that – uh that uh, Mr. Lurie called and, and he was like, well, the biggest thing is he wanted to, you know, show everybody, you know, that he really cares about what this situation is, how the situation is, is going and he's going to do whatever he can to help in, uh, in, in this situation. You know, he wanted to know directly how it was affecting his players. And Brandon Graham says something, you know, that it was kind of unique because I hadn't really heard this from a lot of, a lot of people. And I heard it when I was in Pittsburgh because that ownership was the same type of way Mr. Lurie is they generally care about their players. But he said he came to them almost like a father figure and was like, look, guys, you know, how can I help you? Um, you know, what do you think as far as this whole situation? 
Uh, can I get you pointed in the right direction? You know, can I help you in any type of way? And, you know, for BG to say that he's, he looked at him and, and he felt like it was a fatherly type of situation uh, with the owner, and, you know, just shows how good of a person he is. Because, you know, when you think of fathers, man, you know, especially with, well, with me, you know, that's something that, you know, is very important to me. You know, I lost my father. But he said that Mr. Lurie came in and was that type of presence uh, in that meeting. So, I mean, that's just a big up to Mr. Lurie. And, you know, I, you don't have to convince me because he's my guy still. Yeah, I think it's interesting and, and certainly notable that the Eagles used their – that you know, they've been doing these virtual OTAs now for about a month. Um, and I know them and other teams didn't talk football on Monday. Uh, they're kind of in the same boat we are, that it, it's really not appropriate to talk about football. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about an athlete's role – in social change because um, right now I, I think we're seeing what true leadership is. I think we're seeing it from guys like Malcolm Jenkins and from guys like Rodney McLeod and even, uh, you know, what Carson Wentz did earlier um, last week was important. It was important, not just as a quarterback and a leader of a team, but it was important as honestly, as a white man, in that position um, to, to make that kind of statement. And I, I re for me, uh, and we all approach these things differently, um, and I approach it almost similarly to Carson, right? Like, I'm a, I'm a white guy, grew up in, in a white town, and I, I enter the conversation openly and, and with empathy, trying to understand and I thought that the way he prefaced his statement with that is really important. Um, and, and the fact that he was willing to speak up, it matters. And, and I think, it, it, Barry, you can probably speak to this having been in locker rooms, but that statement from him has to mean a hell of a lot to his teammates, especially the ones who have been on the forefront of this fight for a long time now. Absolutely. You know, and understanding, you know, the type of leadership that – he fell under, you know, when he first got drafted to the team with Malcolm Jenkins and how vocal he was in, uh, on this situation. But the biggest thing with me when I got from that and I looked at Carson and when I heard and when I, mean, when I read the, you know, the, the, the tweet or the, you know, the IG, whatever it was, I got from it that he was very humble in his understanding that he had never been a part of anything like that. For, so for him, you know, he acknowledged the fact that our uh, – his daughter, his wife, his family, they don't go through the same thing. You know, he acknowledged the fact that he's a white guy and, and he hasn't been in our shoes before. But the fact that he went out there and, and, and said, yes, you know, I'm with you. It not only, you know, you know, stabilized that locker room as him being a leader, but the fact that he didn't even address it to his teammates. He wasn't talking to them. He was talking to society in general. He was making it known that this is, goes farther than him being a leader on this team. It goes farther than that locker room. This is a social issue that is bigger than, you know, the team. And for him to acknowledge that, that I mean, that, to me, it, it, it just holds kudos to him. You know, it shows the type of person that he is. You know, he really took it by the horns and said, look, this is something that I, you know, I wasn't aware of it. I mean, I kind of understand it, but I could never feel what you guys are feeling. But bag on it, I'm here. And if you need me, I'm with you because there has to be some change on what's going on in you guys' life. And I love him for that. I appreciate that he did it that way. You know, and, and Carson is so private and so guarded. Um, he, he's not one to, to really, you know, go off the – I don't know, the middle of the road. I mean, he's very down the middle. His answers in press conferences, he doesn't really, you know, and he's always been active with charities and stuff, but um, I thought it showed a lot of growth on his part, um, you know, for him to, to take that step. And, and uh, I'm sure it didn't go, go unnoticed among all his teammates that, um, and that's a big step for Carson. I mean, here's a kid who grew up, you know, in, in North Dakota and he was insulated and, um, you know, so 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 to to understand his responsibility as a leader of this team, and to take that step and show that growth as a person that 
he's not going to just say, I support my teammates, but he's going to really kind of, you know, open himself up. And, and you know, I thought it was a very, um, very, uh, I don't know, what's the word? Um, Poignant? Uh, genuine, um, you know, uh, comments from him. And uh, we kind of saw right. a side of him that we, we haven't seen. And, um, you know, I don't know if that makes us a better football team or guys will play harder, you know, for him. I doubt it. But I just think something like that doesn't go unnoticed. I think we really kind of got a glimpse of who Carson really is. He's so guarded all the time. He doesn't let you in, you know, to that, to his, his thoughts. He doesn't let you into what he's really thinking, except on very rare cases. Um, I thought it was, I thought it was really elegantly stated and, and beautifully stated. And um, yeah, I was really proud of him. Yeah. And, and I think that that's Carson Wentz, not just as a leader of a football team, but Carson Wentz as a leader of a community. Um, I, I think that at this point, you know, it's been so easy for people who aren't black to not worry about it for too long. And it's almost like you're complicit at this point and it sets that standard. And that's an important standard to set um, because when you talk about issues of police brutality and racial injustice, it's not good enough to say, hey, that's someone else's fight. I'll let them fight it um, because that hasn't worked and things haven't changed. So um, I, I think that like we looked at it in the scope of Carson Wentz as a football player, and that's certainly important. And I'm sure his teammates appreciate that. Um, but if Carson's comments inspire other white dudes, quite frankly, to get more involved, it, that it's, it's even more important. Um, and you know, the last, the last week has been a challenging one for, for the whole country. But if George Floyd's death is not going to be in vain, it's going to be because people use this opportunity to rally. People use this opportunity to educate themselves, start open discussions and then influence change. Um, I don't know if we're all ever going to agree on, on the right route for that. And, and I think that we're, we're going to account. That's the next step is to figure out um, where to go from here. But I, I think the most important step is kind of what we're doing right now, right? Um, is exactly. starting, the, starting the dialogue. You know, I grew up in, and it's a saying that always made me cringe. Um, and it always came from a good place, I thought, it is the whole idea that I don't see color. And I don't want to destroy those people who use that saying because I felt like it always came from from the right place it always came from a place that um you're trying to say that you're not a racist and you're trying to say that you respect people of all colors but it, it always misses the point because it just it just hides an issue that has been an important one in this country since its inception and I think the wiser way to go about this is what we're doing, having open discussions about it, um, feeling free enough to ask, you know? Um, I wrote a column today and I reached out to Derek Gunn. I don't know if I should tell the whole story. I reached out to Derek Gunn. I wanted to gain that different perspective on it. And I think that's okay. Um, I, I think that as long as you approach this with the understanding that you don't know everything, and you're trying to learn, you're trying to better yourself, that's kind of where it all starts. And that's exactly right, Dave, you know, and, and you know, this racial injustice has been, it's been around for, you know, I mean, for past 400 years, you know, I mean, you know, this, this is something that, you know, I've experienced my entire life, being from the Midwest or from St. Louis. You know, I, I had those type of situations, you know, even in Ferguson, you know, I, I'm, I'm from this place in Kenlock, in St. Louis, and we had to walk through Ferguson to get to um, the gym. Uh, you know, and I'm only 12 years old, and, and you know, I wanted to be a hooper back then. And you know, it's five of us walking to the gym at seven in the morning with our basketball, and there just happened to be 25 feet in front of us. There were some bottles, some empty beer bottles. So we're walking towards the beer bottles on our way to the gym to go work out um, with a coach on our AAU team. This police officer pulls us over, you know, I mean, just, just totally messing with us and actually arrested us, took us in and said, those were our beer bottles. We're, we're 12 years old, but those are the type of things in that type of neighborhood that, 
you know, what happens all the time. You know, the, the, it, was, it was like a border. I mean, they, they're, Ken Locke and Ferguson are right next to each other. And it's a border. And it's like we weren't allowed over there. And, you know, they weren't allowed in my neighborhood. You know, and that's just the way it was. I, that's the way I grew up. So those type of things happens all the time. And the fact that it takes us talking about this, blacks, whites, um, all minorities talking about it, just get it in the air. Because I could go to, I could have been with you, Dave, and said, hey, Dave, this just happened to you. Like, no, that didn't happen. Well, it doesn't happen to me when I walk somewhere or it doesn't happen to me when I'm driving. I don't get pulled over. Well, to me, you know, that's a part of life. It's a part of my understanding. And for Carson to acknowledge that he doesn't know about that, then that's, that's good. And, you know, you're trying to learn more about that. That's great. You know, once we have more people that aren't white on our, I mean, people that are white on our side and understanding what's going on, I think things will now change because us just complaining and bitching about it, that's just us complaining and bitching. But once you have whites doing the same thing, and can verbalize, you know, if these guys are treated unfair, now change will start. Because it won't just be us. You know, we tried for the longest time, it's not working. But once we get this dialogue going, and people really seeing what's going on, you know, the best thing could have been invented is the camera phone. Because now it's not just us saying it, but it's documented. Now it's real life. Now it's hitting you in the face. So you can no longer turn the cheek to it. And I think that's the biggest thing. Everybody sees that it's bad and that it's, and, and, and it shouldn't happen. So now we're headed in the right direction. A couple things um, come to mind. And, and, you know, I grew up, uh, people don't know about my background. I grew up, my parents were civil rights activists. And uh, I grew up as a kid going to, you know, rallies and, and protests in Washington, uh, civil rights marches um, in New York and Washington. Uh, and, you know, that was, that was a long time ago. You know, that was, that was 35 years ago, uh, 45 years ago. Um, and it's really demoralizing how little has changed since then. We thought, you know, you're so idealistic as a little kid. You thought, well, there's, you know, 500,000 people at this rally. Things are going to really change. And they haven't. And, you know, that's really discouraging. So I think, you know, hopefully some good comes out of, all this right now, but it's, it's going to be a process. It's going to, it's not something that is going to be solved overnight or, or in the next year. It's got to be something that continues a conversation, a dialogue, action, um, education that continues for, you know, forever. And it's not something you just say, well, we, we figured this out. I mean, you know, um, cause it's been, like you said, Barrett, it's been, it's been 400 years, um, we got to keep making progress, but it's it's just such a, you know, it's such a a, a deep issue for for so many reasons. Um, the other thing, and I, I don't want to get into into politics, but this is politics, really. This isn't an issue of Democrats and Republicans, and it drives me crazy that people try to make it that. We're talking about absolutely treating absolutely. people like human beings, treating people equally, has nothing to do with politics, and and. Uh, you know, what party you're in. I mean, we're talking about human decency, basic, you know, human decency uh, of, of treating um, people of all colors and races and creeds as, as your brother. And um, if that's political, man, it, it, I just don't see where you're coming from if, 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 if you look at it that way. And, um, you know, I was born and raised to treat people a certain way. Um, and to me that has nothing to do with you know who you're voting for or what you think of you know that congressman or that congressman so i think that's really important to remember people try to make this political and it's not it's about basic human decency yeah i am um, exactly right i i want to share a story and i don't know if i've ever shared this one before uh and i i, I referenced this discussion on a column i wrote which i want to get into as well um, but a couple years ago, I had a chance to talk to Malcolm Jenkins and I talked to him about being the face of the movement and, and how uncomfortable he was with it. And it was honestly the longest conversation I ever had with Malcolm. It probably lasted 35, 40 minutes. And at the end of it, we were kind of just shooting the shit. And, um, and we had, we had both gotten back from our vacations around the same time. And we'd both been in Africa. He had been in Ghana and I, I think Ghana and I had been in Uganda and we were kind of talking about our experiences there. 
And I couldn't believe that at this point I was what, like 30 years old, maybe 29 years old. And it gave me a perspective I never really had before because I was telling him that I was in Kampala, Uganda, and I was walking down the streets of, of the city. And look, I, I've been the only white person in a, in a group of 30 or, you know, in a, but this, I was the white guy in a town and I'm walking through and I started feeling the eyes on me and, and I started feeling that, you know, like it, it was the first time I left, I ever felt like that. And then I asked Malcolm about his experience in Ghana and I'll never forget it. He told me, I felt like I was home. And, and that it, I, I will never forget that conversation because I think it's, it's, it's so hard for you to train your brain to figure out what someone else goes through on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's where the idea of white privilege comes in that, you know, I've never dealt with that in my own country and, and he deals with it every day. And, you know, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking when, when you really take the time to think about it, Barrett, I'm sure you deal with this every day when you leave your home, you're thinking about what it's like to be a black man. You're thinking about, I can't do this or I have to do this in this certain way because of how it might be perceived. And, and that's crushing for someone who's never been through it to realize that. Um, and, and honestly, disappointing in myself that it took me that long to realize it. Um, so the idea of, of white privilege is not guilt. And, and the idea of white privilege is not that you haven't worked hard. I, I've worked really hard to get what I have, but I think the important difference is that my skin color was never something that held me back. It was, if anything, it gave me an advantage. And um, I think there's an important distinction there because I think when some people hear white privilege, they say, yo, and I, it's not taking away your accomplishments. If you grew up in, in, a, in a poor neighborhood and you worked for everything you had, we're not saying that you, you didn't accomplish a lot, you did. All white privilege means is that the color of your skin was not a hindrance. And I think that's an important distinction to make. Absolutely. You know, and, and, and I, it, it's good that people are now starting to see that, you know, the understanding that you already have, you know, when you're a minority, you already have one strike against you. When you were born, they considered a strike against you. I never thought it was a strike against me, but society thinks it's a strike against me because now I have to go through things that I shouldn't necessarily have to. Like Carson understood that his daughter wouldn't have to go through that because she's not a, a black kid. You know, it, it, he, you know, there's so many things that you don't have to worry about. I, mean, I worry about every day that my two sons can get pulled over from somebody who got up on the wrong side of the bed or, uh, you know, just have this preconceived notion that, they feel as though they're better than my son or better than me even when they pull me over. So they think that they can talk or treat you any type of way. Those are things that we deal with every day. But I mean, it, 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 it's, it's happened so much that it, it's, it's, it's like, you know, it's, it's every day. I mean, this is something that I had, I had to go through. It's, it's, it's already in, in a, you know, view in my head. You know, I can't get rid of it. You know, I am a black man. In fact, I'm a big black man. So I'm an intimidating figure you know, to most people also. But I mean, you, you know, you know what's going on in life. So you, you know, conduct yourself accordingly. And I must say about you two gentlemen, you know what I mean? I don't worry about that with you guys. I mean, you guys, you guys are great. I mean, Rube, Rube hates everybody. We know that, you know what I'm saying? He don't care what color you are. You know what I'm saying? That's Rube. You, Dave, you love everybody. You know, you, you, that's where you carry yourself. I mean, those are all things that, that, you know, the only thing I think about, who are you? Who are you as a person? You know, are you genuine? And that's the way I try to raise my kids, but I still have to teach my kids differently than you would necessarily have to treat your kids. I mean, you have to teach your kids. I have to tell them, hey, if you get pulled over, you know, put your hands on the, on the, um, on the dashboard. That way you give them no reason to think that you're being any type of aggressive or anything else. You know, those are things we have to teach our children. You know, they have to understand that there's a protocol in which when you get pulled over is different than when Carson gets pulled over or when you, Dave, get pulled over. It's different, man. And, and you know, it, it's something that I've dealt with my entire life and, you know, I'm going to keep on dealing with it. But now it's out there and people are really starting to see it now. It's not a foregone conclusion. It's not something that, you know, it's not something that, uh, you know, they, they can just ignore now. You know, this 
situation and what this country is going through right now is really making it prevalent. You know, is 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 prevalent right there. You know, camera phones show it. You know, racism has always been there. It's just now you have camera phones to to put it into the mainstream media. Now there's accountability that's now tied uh, with these this social injustice now. Yeah, I I, I want to shift the conversation a little bit to the athlete's role, um, and, and this is something that I, I wrote a column about today, uh, looking back at NFL players who demonstrated during the national anthem a, a few years ago, including Colin Kaepernick and, and Malcolm Jenkins, among many others, um, and it, it's just it's a it's a painful reminder that those guys. That like you know, taking a knee or putting a fist in the air was the most nonviolent. Seriously, right. <laughs> the most nonviolent yeah. protest you can ever have. And I hope that people who really push back against that are starting to realize why they did that. And I know it's it's too late. I know that Kaepernick lost his career because of it, and 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 more people have been murdered by police brutality since then. But I hope that people can understand that um, athletes have a role in society and you kind of owe it to them to listen to them. I mean, if you're a person who feels okay cheering for your favorite player scoring a touchdown, you damn well better care when his brother gets killed in the street. And if you don't, you really seriously need to reconsider your morals. And, and I, I think that um, what those guys did and, and Kaepernick paid a, a pretty hefty price for it. Um, it was admirable back then, admirable back then. And, and it's still admirable today. Yeah. I think there's a lot of, a lot of people out there who just want pro athletes or, or, you know, any celebrities or whatever it is to just be robots go act in the movie, you know, go play the football game and shut up and, you know, do your press conference about what happened on third and 10. And, and, and that's it. Um, they're human beings and they have this platform and I, you know, I, I applaud them for, for using it. And, um, you know, I think that's kind of such an archaic way of thinking. I mean, um, if, <laughs> if you're trying to get Malcolm Jenkins to not, express his opinion. You just don't understand who Malcolm Jenkins is and what he's all about. Um, you know, you, I think people need to look at these guys as three dimensional human beings and not just, uh, not just athletes. And so many of them have, have so much to say and have done so much. I mean, uh, both financially and as far as, um, you know, action and, and organizing. Um, I mean, just the player coalition, has, you know, just in, in terms of educating people and, and the work that they've done, uh, educating people on on what's happening, um, I really admire players that that speak out. And you know, it used to be. I remember when I started following sports. You know, it was such a small minority of guys, and they were really, really looked down on. If you if you had any sort of opinion, you know, if there were, you know, players who, um, you know, came out against the Vietnam War. I mean, you were considered, you know, a, a you know, the, some crazy radical, and it, and it could cost you your career. Something as innocuous as that. Um, so it's hard and sometimes it can put guys in a very difficult position. Like you look at Kaepernick and, and others. Um, but if, if fans want their players to be robots and not speak their mind, you know, that world is gone. And, and, uh, you know, whether it's actors or musicians, you know, I love his music, but I hate his politics. Well, you know what? <laughs> you got to understand that you're getting the whole, you're getting the whole package here with, you know, whoever it is, whether it's Bruce Springsteen or, or Carson Wentz, whoever it is, Malcolm Jenkins. And um, I think it's important. You know, I think it's, it's the, the work that all these guys do is important. Um, most of them put their money where their mouth is as far as donations and, and charity work and, and raising money. And, and uh, yeah, I, 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 I never understood that, you know, that notion of just looking at Malcolm Jenkins as a great safety and just, the rest of it, I just don't, I don't want to know. Cause that's who he is and that's what he's all about. And it's such a big part of um, his, his essence and his, his, you know, his being. Uh, 
I, I can't, I can't separate it. I, I personally can't. I don't know how anyone can. That's, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, you're exactly right, Ruben. There's, there's three different facets to a player's life, you know, and you, you discuss them, man. You, you, what they do on the field, they may be great players, but also when they get off the field, who they are as a person, but who made them that person, which is the third, you know, facet, you know, what took them through their journey to get to where they are is another facet of their life, you know, and, and who helped them get there. And sometimes these players have to be the voices of the people that they left behind or the people that helped them get to where they are in their life. So, you know, I, you know, I was just thinking, you know, I don't know you guys remember Mike Bloomberg, you know, and the, the, the stop and frisk. Imagine being a young guy back then, a, a, a black guy back then, a young guy, and you're getting stopped and frisked every day just because it was, it was, it was, you know, uh, um, the police were made to do that. You know, it was, it, they could do that whenever they wanted to, you know, and, and you're, you're a young kid, very impressionable, and you're going to, you're going to school and you're getting stopped and frisked. You go to school the next day, you're getting stopped and frisked. Now, you know, the, you know, what's going through your head is not, it's not a friendly interpretation on how you see police officers. And then you happen to make it big and get into the NFL. Well, those are things now that they can, as an NFL player, they can use on their platform to say, hey, this is what happened to me. It wasn't nice. It wasn't cool. And we need to change policy in order to stop that. Well, that's what these players are doing. They haven't forgotten the things that they went through through their lifetime. And they want people to know that there are injustices that they had to face when they were young. And now they want to show that these things are not acceptable uh, now, and they weren't acceptable back then. But the policies have to change. The preconceived notions of you think of a, a, a young black kid has to change. They're not drug dealers. They're not all drug dealers. They're not all dope dealers. They're not, they're not you know, all, you know, guys that just want to go out and rob people. That's what some people think. I mean, I'll tell you a quick story. I went to Kansas State University, and I met this guy. He had never met a black person in his life. The only black people he saw were on TV. And some of the things that, you know, went through his head were ignorant because he just wasn't faced with that. Well, a lot of people now are faced with things they hadn't seen or they didn't think happened in real life. And as a white guy seeing a policeman with his knee on a guy's neck and he didn't feel as though he didn't have to take it off, you know, that's like, uh, that's appalling. But it's in real life, you can't ignore it now because it's right there. So at this point, now that you've acknowledged that it's happened and we need to change it, now what are we gonna do as we go forward? Yeah, it, it's, it's important to figure out the next steps um, I think one way you do it is what we're doing is having the conversation. Another way you do it is by donating money and time. And another way is by voting. Um, and, and I know the last one is frustrating for people because it, it hasn't necessarily worked in the past. You know, we, we've been telling people to vote for how many years and right. it, it feels like we're, we're turning our wheels. And, and I think that that's the frustration we see right now on our streets, you know, um, it, it, there've been so many false equivalencies over the last week. Um, and if you're a person who is more bothered by looting than you are by deaths of unarmed black men, you, you need to reprioritize a little bit. Um, because one does not excuse the other, but you have to kind of realize that there's anger and there's frustration. Um, and sometimes that boils over. And I think that's what we're seeing right now. And I, I hope that if you are out there exercising your rights, I hope you're staying safe right now. Um, but it's not easy. And I, I think that um, that frustration boiling over, are we losing some property? Sure. Um, but I understand it. I do because I'm pissed off. And I, I think um, everyone should be to some extent. And, and we all channel it different ways. I do want to say, you know, I've seen some, this has been a really hard week for, for everybody. 
I've seen some things that really give me some hope, and I think it's important to – I mean, what we saw in Camden, I don't know if you guys had a chance to see the, the video. Yes, um, absolutely. Vic Starfin uh, is a councilman. Vic Starfin was a great basketball player at Camden. I actually covered him. I saw him score, I think, 50 points against Pemberton. And he's now an activist and a councilman in Camden. And he had video, man, of the, the protesters and, and, the, and the police together, marching together. We saw in Miami – video of, of police and protesters having a dialogue and, and um, you know, just really kind of making progress. You could see it and, and peace, do it peacefully and talking and understanding each other, making an attempt to understand where the other side's coming from. Um, there wasn't enough of that, but, you know, we did see it in, in a few places. Um, I thought what we saw in Camden was really inspiring. And um, I give a lot of kudos to Vic Christofferin because I know he's been working really hard on, um, you know, connecting the, the community and, and the police in Camden. Um, and, uh, you know, so, I mean, it's been really hard and it's been, you know, so much has been really hard to see and hard to take and you, you feel helpless, but there, are, there's hope, you know, you see some, some good things happening and it kind of, you know, makes you feel like, it, we, you know, we, we at least have a shot here. We have a, a if, if they can do it in a few places with the right leadership and the right guidance, um, you know, we can see more of that, hopefully. Absolutely. I mean, change, you know, change is, is, is something that's very uncomfortable. And, you know, people, you know, are going to be uncomfortable in, 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 in certain situations, but there has to be a change. There has to be something uh, done for the protocol of which Black people are, 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 number one, viewed by certain police districts and, and certain officers. And there should be something in place that's going to, you know, deter them from doing that. There has to be some type of protocol that, you know, that is, is that will deter it from, from the abuse that, you know, they feel as though they have the right to treat black people that way. There has to be something, a check and balance for that, you know, because at this point, I mean, we can talk about it all day, but if there's not policy in place and at this point, these ex officers, uh, really getting the law handed to them and have them judged by the same laws that they were breaking. I mean, they need to have that, you know, they need to have that done. There has to be a, a, a force, you know, that, you know, checks them for doing this type of things, people. I mean, it, it's, it's not right. A man's life was taken for nothing. I mean, for nothing. I mean, okay, he forced a check or something or a fake $20 bill, something of that nature. And he lost his life over that. That's crazy. Justice is important. And uh, I know we'll all be following that case whenever it comes up. Um, this is generally an uncomfortable conversation, but I think it's important for all of us to get outside of our comfort zones right now. Um, do you guys have anything else to add before we wrap this up? Just the last thing for me, and you touched on this, Dave, is – um, I would urge people if you're in position to, um, yeah, you know, find a charity that means something to you that you feel like does good work. Um, I was going to go through some of them, but you, you know who they are. Find, find one, um, research them, look into them, make sure they're legit. And, um, you know, I mean, we, the timing of all this, you know, with COVID going on, you know, it, it gives you, it's a tough choice, you know, can you go out and protest and, and be safe about it? Um, you know, uh, can you can you go to a march, uh, a peaceful march, and 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 be safe? Um, I mean, I can I can tell you from doing it as a kid and going to, you know, uh, all the protests I went to and as a teenager and holding the sign up and, um, you know, it, it's a it's a good feeling. I mean, you feel like you're making a difference. So consider all those things that Dave mentioned earlier, um, ways that you can make a difference. What can I do? Um, whether it's a dialogue, uh, uh, donating money, voting, um, walking with a sign, even in front of your house, you know, love. Just hold up a sign that says love, peace, whatever it is. Do, you know, how can I make a difference? What small thing can I do that's going to help? Yeah, Barry, you, know, you got anything wanna, before? I just want to thank you guys, you two, you know, and, and, and all others, you know, that are not minorities, really seeing and trying to really um, – understand what black people have been going through for a long time and now 
you know, seeing that there needs to be a change, you know, and not just sweeping it under the rug and, and, you know, not necessarily ignoring it, but not doing anything to help the cause, you know, you know, you know, silence is just as bad as going out there and really doing it. So at this point, you know, I love the fact that people are generally seeing what we've been seeing for a long time and they're taking action with it. And I mean, I mean it's huge that there's some action going on uh, and not just talk. Absolutely. All right. We, we thank all the listeners, um, especially we always thank you guys. But if you listen to this podcast, uh, I know it means a lot to me and, and the other guys. Uh, stay safe. Take care of each other. We will catch you next time.